something happened suddenly and they they completely got destroyed because of the eruption of the great volcano there okay. yes i said that the whole indian subcontinent was covered by something like 5 meter thickness of volcanic ash and sometimes the artisan community or craftsman community might have been enslaved by the rulers under subjection they might have been working hi viewers hope you're all doing good welcome to the elcube show today's guest is dr rajan gurukal sir who is a social scientist professor writer who is currently working as a vice chairman for kerala state higher education council and he has also he, uh, done some archaeology like little ex- excavation and stuff so in the podcast today he is going to speak about the early human history where the humans have come from about homo sapiens homo habilis and all that and all these names are very new to me too but we are all going to discover in the podcast where we are from are we from africa is did everyone migrate from africa to europe and all the other subcontinents or how long has it been that human early human civilization existed and how did they live to south indian history and also about current day education and what are the methods to improve technology and education so let's get into the podcast and learn all this uh, you have to be a little patient because it's more about archaeology and excavations and it's going to be really exciting please like subscribe and comment down below for your for the future ideas Namaste sir welcome to the El Cube show okay thank you namaste um hi viewers here we have Rajan Gurukal sir sir can you please tell me about yourself sir so that the viewers will know i know i know about you but can you please briefly tell me about yourself okay uh, i started as a student of commerce at the plus 2 level and then i shifted to history uh, not on my own but the teacher of mine directed me to do that because i was not quite clear you no know, what was my aptitude what was my interest it was not clear to me but uh, one of the teachers you know, he uh picked up and then uh actually i was sitting in the in the bcom class okay. and right at the time of see the students going out after the uh ac session uh, he picked me then he immediately asked what, what do you think about yourself see you do not know arithmetic now what, what are you going to do with accountancy <laughs> and then he took me to the department and then did a very gentle counseling and that was a government college where everything was possible so i could be shifted from the commerce to history yeah but somehow uh, i was quite fortunate that i had very good lecturers very good teachers uh, and uh, see the first thing i could get out of was the lack of self respect okay. see uh use the general understanding that someone who learns history is of a backward kind and is not having a high level sensibility and history is such a very easy kind of academically unchallenging kind of uh, say um, can, can i ask sir so that's a general notation in the public you're saying yes that's a general feeling oh and naturally see uh not a very high scorer at the uh, the passing level you know the secondary level um i was thinking that anyway i am fated to learn this but once i started listening to the lectures yes. i started uh, knowing the centrality of the subject the profundity of it and uh, and then teachers you know including the one teacher who picked me so at the plus 2 level itself i started knowing uh the truth about this subject that it's really a very challenging kind of knowledge field yeah yeah, yeah. actually yeah. i would i would disagree with that general notation because i always found people who liked history to be more intelligent actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no we can find so many such explanations but 
Uh, I was referring to uh, my experience. Yeah. But still, so all this was in Kerala, sir. Your your college, everything was in Kerala. Yeah, yeah. I studied only in started with a, a rural village school and then went to the government colleges. And everywhere I had, you know, I should repeatedly say this. I was gifted with very important teachers who respected the subject and uh, who always delivered scholarly lectures, irrespective of the fact of whether the students were capable of understand, understanding. You were fortunate to have teachers like ah, that. That was really nice. You are fortunate to have teachers like that, sir. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I still believe so. Yes. Yeah. It's a coincidence, you know, in government college, uh, teachers get transferred and uh, you have to be really lucky to have always very good teachers cons- I mean, consecutively. Yeah. 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 Yes. So currently you are working as a, a vice chairman, sir, to the education, higher education council board, uh, right? Yes. Yeah. Of, of Kerala That's state. Right. Yes, of the state. This is a policy uh, making uh, council and uh, its main uh, responsibility is to coordinate universities in the state and uh, render the national level policies plausible in the uh, state level universities. Always it's a uh, coordination job and also uh, it is to advise the government, advise even the governor who is chancellor of the universities. Yeah. So it's a legislatively uh, empowered council. Yeah. yeah. I specialize in ancient history. Okay. And you know, archaeology is part of that. Yes. <laughs> so that way I was interested in archaeology. And I also did a little bit of field archaeology as well. Like actually in excavations and stuff like yes, that. Yes, yes, yeah. Totally. Ooh, uh, uh. So jumping right into the topic, sir, then, what is archaeology, sir? Like what, what yeah. would you say? Yes, yes. Uh, archaeology is study of old materials, ancient goods, and ancient artifacts, to say precisely. And on the basis of that, archaeologists identify the material culture of the period. And they use various scientific methods of dating, uh, starting from, uh, you know, identifying the the uh, stratum where they located these yes. Yes. Art- artifacts or the old the remains. Stratum meaning by you're saying the Earth's levels, sir? Uh, yes, yes. Earth's yeah. levels. Yeah. Yeah, there's a systematic study of strata yeah. called stratigraphy. So yes. stratigraphy is the basic understanding of the period and then there are scientific datings okay based on various science disciplines okay okay so what are we exactly trying to learn sir by excavating all these archaeological sites what yeah. as our generation or you know the the current and the previous yeah. generations what are we trying to learn from it uh, one is the antiquity of the past cultures mm-hmm. and then uh Serious archaeologists will ask the artifacts, who made it and for whom, and then would study the technology of that. If technology is really uh, important, then technological knowledge of the time is understood. And then if it is a time-consuming manufacture, it involves not only knowledge, a skill, but also a lot of time, which would mean that the uh, the craftsman was spending most of the time for making the artifact, which would mean that somebody else might have uh, taken care of his food and so on. Yes. Um, and then, see, it also would mean that anyway, that kind of time-consuming manufacture wouldn't be done for himself or his family. It would be done for somebody else. But somebody else, I would mean, uh, an aristocratic kind of person yes. or a ruler kind. Ruler, because, yes. Uh, yeah, the ruler or aristocrat would be able to provide him with the facilities so that he could expend his craft, time-consuming craft, for the manufacture of the, the thing that the aristocrat wanted or the powerful group wanted. And you then... Uh, uh, understand the social relations. There is a relationship of power 
and sometimes the artisan community or craftsman community might have been enslaved by the rulers under subjection they might have been working so like this from just an artifact looking at its fineness and then uh see precious uh, nature of the material now you can imagine a variety of things uh in an academically challenging way that is the importance of archaeological material to put it in very layman terms and like very plain terms which everybody can understand so uh, are we trying to educate us by looking at the artif- artifacts and then um try trying to improvise ourselves and sometimes not making the mistakes that so- that societies have done uh, improvising our society culture as well in all the yes. process yeah it's very carefully done with the help of methodological preoccupation that is with the support of logic and then there should be clear evidence uh, that is there so when you are asking me then i should be able to prove this before you it should be convincing to you. and for which sometimes mere empirical thing alone will not help you will have to be knowledgeable in uh, say social theory that is theory is talking about social relations social structure social processes power relations and so th- these are all theoretically uh, uh, you know important areas so first uh, one has to be made knowledgeable in these fields then the student will be able to imagine at the same level and then uh, will be uh, kind of convinced yeah yeah well when you're saying all this um while i was doing the research i found that there is this archaeological site in tamil nadu if i am correct where they have found the uh, dna and dead um, skeletons of 6th uh, century if i am correct but those were like multiple dnas of europeans of africans yeah. of indians so yeah. maybe here we are learning from that societal aspect that they were coming and working for the, these kingdoms here yeah and the burial ground which was found i think the yeah, the place name is chennellur yes sir that's that's it uh, yeah <laughs> yes, in tamil nadu yeah yes yes uh, we see one important point we understood is that uh, now as in the past out of africa thesis is valid regarding the distribution of human beings yes that, yes <laughs> uh, yes in, interestingly yes <laughs> in the uh, lake rudolf area that is in kenya yeah uh a big lake is there called lake rudolf and then uh that place is called old wai gorge you know in africa gorges are there the water is available only at a deep level oh, and then okay. uh and people live at a very high altitude but there also uh, sometimes water used to be available but always their rivers are seen from the cliff it's deep and not easily accessible that kind of uh, a geographical system is seen in kenya and you you have a lake also it's called rudolf and interestingly around the lake you have fossils of all kinds of um, monkeys closer to human being see starting from pithecanthropus erectus to homo sapien wow all these fossils have been found there uh it's interesting to imagine that god had his genetic workshop there in kenya if yeah. if our mother belongs to that place the first human being uh and then you find all fossils belonging to all kinds of hominids in the same place in in a place something like some uh, 40 square kilometer area wow. and there a beautiful museum um in um uh, addis ababa uh it's very important because see you find three generations of anthropologists starting from uh isaac uh, leaky then mary leaky uh no professor leaky and then his uh, wife also was 
a physical anthropologist, fossil specialist, and and then their son, Dr. Isaac Leakey. They made the path-breaking discoveries in the history of uh, transformation of hominids into Homo sapiens sapiens. It's believed that uh, Homo sapiens uh, itself was a, a programmed animal, programmed for spreading wherever. It's very interesting to notice that for no reason, from a place of prosperity, they migrated across <laughs> the search <laughs> for hope of reaching a good place. So why did they migrate? We do not know. We can only say that it was already programmed in the brain uh, mm -hmm. that they should migrate. Yeah. So two questions here, sir, uh, from what you said. One, so the theory which everybody um, says that um, everybody started from Africa and then we migrated to Europe and some to Indian subcontinent. And so you believe in that theory? Yes, it is okay. so far, it is convincing. Right. Okay. There, there used to be a big question regarding India that, see, we know that the antiquity of the Homo sapiens is only two lakh years. Hmm. And then um, if that is the antiquity in Africa, then it should be lesser in the case of other places. And then the uh, scholarly assumption is that is the two lakh year old Homo sapien migrated to the uh, Arabian uh, landscape, and then through this sea coast, they uh, um, moved on and then reached the Gujarat area, and then came down to Peninsular India, yeah. and because they were having a sea combing kind of uh, yeah. journey, yeah. and they went right through the Bay of Bengal and, and then uh, reached up to Vietnam, that kind of travel. But when they reached Indonesia, something happened suddenly and they, they completely got destroyed because of the eruption of the great volcano there. Yes. And it said that the whole Indian subcontinent was covered by something like five meter thickness of volcanic ash. Wow. So that that kind of eruption happened 75,000 years ago. This based on a chemical study on the volcanic ash. So it's uh, clear that you have a history of human habitation in India. Anyway, somewhere near one and a half lakh years. You see, it's, we assume that at least some 50,000 years might have been taken by the Africans, African homo, sap homo sapiens to reach India. And they got destroyed completely. And you find a second level migration, migration backwards from the Indonesian side. And also further, one from the Levant area, that is the African area. And then mingling somewhere uh, and then filling uh, the coastal India with the people. But uh, upsetting this theory, suddenly there was a discovery uh, about the presence of human beings in two places. One at Atrapakam near Tamil Nadu, I mean Chennai, yeah. and another in northern Karnataka. Atrapakam in Tamil Nadu and uh, Hangsi Baichwal in northern Karnataka. Okay. They, they uh, yielded what is called the Paleolithic tool of, yes. of the uh, Acheulean kind. Acheulean or Ignatian are the two types of Paleoliths. Yeah, but uh, um, but sir, isn't Paleolithic only 50,000 years? Is it 1 lakh years old? Uh, 50,000? Uh, yeah, that was our understanding. But now there is quite a lot of difference. Right. It's, Paleoliths were actually used by Homo sapiens, uh, but uh, it was also used by earlier hominids like Homo habilis. Okay. So they, and and then the Atrepakam uh, stone tool, and then the Angsi Baichwal Karnataka got dated. Okay. And in, interestingly, a physics related dating called ESR dating. That is 
ഇലക്ട്രോൺ സ്പിൻ റെസൊനൻസ് ടെക്സ്റ്റ് ഏറ്റവും ഇലക്ട്രോൺ ഈസ് അണ്ടർസ്റ്റ് ബി സ്പൈറലിംഗ് ഡൗൺ ആൻഡ് ദെൻ ഗോയിങ് അപ്പ് സോ ദാറ്റ് ദാറ്റ് ഹാസ് എ ടെക്സോണമി ഓഫ് ഇറ്റ്സ് ഓൺ റിഗാർഡിംഗ് ദി പീരിയഡ് ഐ ഡു നോട്ട് നോ ദി ഡീപ്പർ ഡീപ്പർ ഫിസിക്സ് അബൌട്ട് ഇറ്റ് ബട്ട് ഇ എസ് ആർ ഡേറ്റിംഗ് ഈസ് റിലയബിൾ ഓൺ ദി ബേസ് ഓഫ് ഇ എസ് ആർ ഡേറ്റിംഗ് ഇറ്റ് ഷോഡ് ആൻറ്റിക്വിറ്റി ഓഫ് ഫൈവ് ലാക്ക് ഇയേഴ്സ് വാവ് സോ ദാറ്റ് <laughs> that really meant a near human migration had taken place again from africa but they had reached na and northern karnataka 5 lakh years ago ah, and 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 they were having life what happened to them we do not know because of the volcanic eruption definitely might they might have been washed out but uh, uh, we have archaeological remains of these people not only in the form of the uh, origination you know uh, etulian uh, stone tools but also in the form of their dwellings the best example is uh, um, the madhya pradesh uh, what is that big site called painting site uh, I, th- i think the name of the ga- a cave is bimbetka okay okay we bet yeah okay with lot of paintings there you have remains definitely not belonging to the later wave of people people of the tulak antiquity that we are talking about earlier hominids okay so wow okay so i have lot of questions right now i'll ask like one by yeah. one so initially yeah. when you said that home you uh, the process of homo sapiens started from 2 and a half lakh years yes. right yes. until our yes. understanding yes. until now but these yeah. findings are saying us it's more easily 5 lakh years yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But, but here in this 5 lakh years are we sure they are they are completely homo sapiens or are they in the evolution of homo sapiens and you know they they, they were hominids in that cave we are okay. talking about in the pradesh and also in northern karnataka area and maybe they were they might have spread to other high altitude places okay but but are and, they homo sapiens at that point yeah and and then uh, the antiquity of such hominids uh, in africa goes back to 35 lakh years wow that is it uh, and we have reliable potassium argon dating of the fossils so the, the the farthest we can go is 35 lakh years sir is that the Yeah, yeah but uh, uh, that hominids and homo sapien were different species yes they never crossed or yes. they, they could not have you know uh, given rise to hybrids homo habilis it is said had used the small stone weapons very sharp small stone tools but uh, homo sapien had hafted hand axe in hand and the interesting thing is that along the red sea coast some skulls were identified as belonging to the homo habilis and all these skulls at the back showed a a, a, a kind of rupture uh, resulting from heavy uh, you know blowing or see a kind of percussion point which is uh, presumed to have been resulted from the hitting by the homo sapien with his hand axe so uh, it is now presumed that homo habilis was completely destroyed by homo sapien okay so can i ask you here before i forget the names ah homo habilis how do they look sir like do they look very close to us yes yes almost like human beings but a little uh, hunchback they they okay. wouldn't be looking at the sky they that's the difference they can't not the sky yeah not not very tall uh, maybe about 4 four, four and a half feet okay but very long arms a homo habilis you you described sir so there is other thing other um thing which you said was found in india in tamil nadu and northern karnataka before yeah. before homo sapiens so what was that homo that belonged to a hominid closer to homo sapiens so what would be the description of that sir homo, homo habilis 
we do not know okay. whether succeeded in migration but okay. uh, other hominids certainly might have migrated for example homo erectus okay homo erectus uh, is uh, indicating a clear difference because they could keep their head aloft and uh, and could look at the sky so they had their back more or less uh, in in an erect form so they were called homo erectus okay so they could walk um, as an an erect uh, person and uh, that itself distinguished them from other you know ape like species yeah is there any chance all these coexisted together at any certain period of time yeah anyway definitely homo habilis and homo sapien that's coexist okay yeah. okay yes. and they were in the same habitat therefore this competition and 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 then the consequence i referred to earlier there is one hitting the other to death wow that's a lot of information right there sir here <laughs> we are like we are talking about so many races what we have right now in the world and then we have so much information i think we've been carrying that out <laughs> yeah yeah oh, what wow. you know, should think about is see the relationship between archaeological dating and then areas like chemistry physics and so on so on the one side we have potassium argon dating and there is carbon 14 dating now the esr you know electron spin resonance dating so there are various scientific methods of confirming antiquity of the past is students should be told about this right okay great and okay. then dna you started saying about that yeah now dna is helping us to study yeah. about better distribution of human beings and now dna is confirming that everywhere in the past uh, only composite cultures existed people interacted uh, and coexisted and then uh, unlike what we think uh, there existed only uh, mixed cultures composite cultures so there is can you, no can you please explain more about composite cultures exactly other is you know, uh, when a group was reaching an area area had pre existing people initially although they encountered and, and maybe some kind of violent clashes and so on but they had come to terms with reality and coexisted peacefully and they intermarried and uh, uh, li- like that you know in various ways they had a relationship of exchange that is what is happening right now in the world yes yeah <laughs> okay exchange of ideas exchange of material goods and the best peaceful source of exchange was exchanging women and which later on became an institution called marriage yes <laughs> but if you if you discuss archaeology of marriage then you reach the ancient societies which exchanged women yeah uh, as part of their treaty a uh, part of their uh, you know peaceful agreements right that continued for quite some time all yes. conquering kings yes yes but they to terms with uh, this yeah. institution called exchange of women oh god okay and all religions sp- spread like that exchange yes. exchange of goods ideas technology so exchange was something very important in the past and it's in that sense see we call every culture as a composite culture okay uh, there there could be some ethnically uh, a pure group in isolated pockets yes but if they had started developing then development would require goods that they did not have mm-hmm. ideas that they did not have technology that they did not have and then as part of the diffusion of these then various institutions practices customs rights beliefs all this would circulate and then uh, you will find people also getting uh, mixed up and uh, finally would result in the making of composite culture okay so now let's come back to south india sir particularly south india will concentrate on yeah um, so before i 
as far as my knowledge goes, before the Cholas and the, uh, you know, the Pandyas and the Cheras, Cheras are also called as the Kerala Putras, right? Yeah, yes. So before them, how was the how was the world back then in South India? Like, how did it exist? Yeah, South India in isolated pockets, I told you, the hominid select system. Okay. And then the Paleolithic people and then the Neolithic people. Yes. And before uh, the Neolithic people, Mesolithic people. Mesolithic people, yes, sir. Yes. And and then the Microlithic people okay. who used small flints as weapons and yeah. so on. So do you, do you think all these Mesolithics, Neolithics, and then um, I think there is Chalcolithics and then Megalithics, right? Yes. Yeah. But Chalcolithic so, was not important in, in South India. Alkalithic okay. you find important only in uh, areas where copper was available. Okay. So for example, uh, Indus civilization came out of uh, Alkalithic culture. Okay. And so they emerged as bronze using people. Yes, yes. They discovered that copper with with its malleability and you know ductile character. Uh, couldn't be used as an effective weapon. But soon they discovered that some impurities in copper ore and also some other elements like tin and arsenic and so on could be mixed up with uh, copper and made bronze. Mm. So they made bronze and then once they could make bronze, oh, yeah. that changed their technology entirely and you find early civilizations were all bronze age civilizations. Weapons. All the weapons yeah. and swords yeah. and everything came. A very hard weapon. Yeah. The, uh, that technology uh, enabled them to manufacture all kinds of things and then trade became important okay. and we had Harappan civilization or the otherwise so, called all these Mesolithics, Neolithics, and all the Megalithics, all these are named according to what kind of things they're using, like stones to next going yes. to copper yes. to next going to bronze, according to what they're using. Yes. Polished okay. stone was the basic weapon during the Neolithic period. Mm -hmm. But it was also important due to their knowledge in agriculture. Yes. Yeah. They were the progenitors of agriculture. Okay. And that really made a big difference. So that was like 10,000 years ago from now? Yeah, more than that, 12,000 years ago. 12,000 years ago, right. Yeah. Okay, so that's when the agriculture started. Yes, that in fact led to the Calcolithic period and then the Bronze Age civilization. Bronze Age and then... I but you know. don't have a Bronze Age civilization in South India. So far, we have no knowledge. There isn't anything called a Megalithic culture and Megalithic people. We have to understand them in terms of their social formation, in terms of their life, their mean, uh, their means of uh, production, and then you know livelihood thing. Yeah. And then we are uh, clear that they were cattle keepers, and then we are cultivating millets in various places. So they were millet growing, cattle keeping people, people. Uh, who could be rightly described as agro pastoralists. Okay. But they're they're doing all this in uplands or in uh... in arid in arid uh, stony area. Okay. In the case of South India, you have uh, either side, uh, you know, uh, hilly forest areas, yes. and then the undulating terrain, also with a lot of po forest pockets, and then a lot of marshy areas, and then the rivers, and then the flood. Yeah. That's the deltas. Okay. Now, during this period, they had no technology for cultivating the deltas. Mm -hmm. Although we find in certain uh, burials, remains of thrust hoar and also maybe plowshare, but plowing was possible in uh, areas in the uh, elevated plains where water was available, but they were not able to access the deltas. Okay. That means they were not able to to wet uh, wet rice agriculture at that stage. Although rice is mentioned, that is not Orissa sativa, but Orissa novera that was grown in red soil uh, and also elevated uh, uh, stony areas, but with availability of water. 
So they thought that um, the water source is only from the sky when it rains. And yes. they know that you could use it in the delta areas of the riverbeds. Yeah, but soon they learned the yeah. technique of uh, storing water, particularly in areas where the soil had, uh, uh, you know, capacity to re retain water. So in such depressions, they stored water, particularly in uh, elevated places, so that they could uh, use uh, sluices for distributing water, because from the height, the water will flow down, and they could, uh, I, you know, uh, cut canals and then take water to various places. In Without, rocky ponds, maybe. In uh, rocky uh, ponds, they uh, store water. No, no, not even rocky in Andhra and Tamil Nadu and various parts of Karnataka. You have a uh, soil condition with the low permeability. Mm. In Kerala, you find water just fast going down. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. In Andhra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, you have therefore the reservoir system. For, but that began only uh, at a later stage, not earlier than 4th century AD, 5th century AD. Yeah, yeah. So coming back to 2nd century, which we can we call that Middle Ages, sir, or should we call that Iron Age, the 2nd century and 3rd century? Uh, we can call early historic period because early historic period. the time uh, writing was, uh, although not extensively, writing was there. Okay, okay, okay. So writing even goes back to say second century BC. If Mangulam Brahmi label can be dated uh, reliably, then it goes to second century BC. Okay. So coming back to this Pandyas, Cholas, and Cheras, but is yes. Cheras, they are doing the trade with the Romans, sir. Cheras are from Kerala. Yeah, these have to be understood not as the rulers engaged in trade, but okay. the, the trading communities engaged in exchange. This, uh, and, and it's also wrong to call in a very general way as trade, because trade is possible only in a monetized community. Yes. Community using money. But business community. Means of payment and measure of value. Yeah. And that community alone will have what is called the notion of price. And when there is the notion of price, then it is implied that they had notion of profit. I'm not saying that other exchanges did not involve concept of value, but concept of value and exchange value are two different things. Yes. We have evidence in poems that if somebody, uh, you know, borrowing 10 mangoes from a family, even after five or six years, the family could give five mangoes back. Yes, five mangoes only. Okay. That means they had no notion of interest. Yes. Notion yeah. of profit. Yeah. But when there is anticipation about a future price, yes. then there is, uh, you know, that is uh, the thing called exchange value. You have a value in mind and then an exchange value also in mind. And yeah. then price comes out. Yeah. So that is the difference between cost and then price. Price is different from cost. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, then you know, when uh, you have a, a community thinking only about the social cost, nothing else, then they will not be exchanging goods at price with the notion of exchange value. In, in, during the uh, Indo-Roman period, it's wrongly called Indo-Roman. Yeah. But they were exchanging uh, gold, if I'm correct. They're exchanging spices and getting uh, yeah. gold coins. Yes, there, we have a uh, lot of gold coins. Uh, all of them found as treasure trove in various places. They were found as hoards. Why did they hoard the the gold coins? Because yes. they could only store them as part of their valuables, not as currency. Yeah. Current, uh, currency will not be buried and stored like yeah. that. Yeah. But ornaments would be. Precious <laughs> objects would be stored. Yeah. And interestingly, I, even by 10th century, 11th century, Kerala inscriptions uh, mention these coins of the Roman times as old kashe, and they are found sometimes with a small loop built on the periphery of the coin or several coins with an aperture at the center. So they were 
just uh, pierced through a thread and then stored, I mean, uh, you know, bound and kept like that. Others were just used as part of the ornaments. Wow. E even today, one of the traditional <laughs> ornaments Kasu. in Kerala yeah. is, is called the Kasumala. Yes, Kasu, yes. <laughs> Kasumala, yes. Oh, so that, that's where it started from. Yes. So for a wow. long time, still 13th century, yeah. uh, these people were not using gold as money. They were <laughs> using gold only as valuable. You say Roman civilization is more advanced by the time they were reaching Missouri's, the Patanam, than ours? Yeah, definitely. De definitely. Far advanced. That was an aristocratic society which minted coins which knew uh, what is called trade, profit-oriented trade. Uh, but in the process of, you know, bringing various goods to the West Coast and taking away various goods to the other, they had to take the help of all kinds of people, slaves and camel, uh, camel men, and then had lot laborers and all kinds of people. Many of them were at the level of barter and at the level of you know goods for goods exchange. It was not possible for them to have trade with the slaves or trade with the uh, headlord laborers and uh, the camel men in the desert and so on. But uh, certainly with the holiday contractors, they might have exchanged their service with uh, gold coins. Similarly, when gold coins reached here, they got spices, particularly yes. pepper. Yes. In return, they gave gold coins, but not with any notion of price. Kings were given, I mean, not kings, the chieftains were given gold coins to please them. Also, they might have given wine to the chieftains to uh, please them. And chieftains also might have provided some help uh, possible for their stay and in various ways, yeah. there are some references to the Chera chieftains making uh, arrangements for lighthouse for the ships arriving. Mm. And then they were able to resist the pirates in this in the coastal sea. Mm. These are the helps okay. that they did. And yeah. traders reciprocated it with yeah. gifts of um, as you were saying about the sailors and then all the ships and everything, the Cholas, I believe they have about like 1 million Navy soldiers. So was it at, around the same period of time you were talking about the Patanam and all no, this? No, 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 no. It's after that. Maybe like from 1 million soldiers, that was like, wow, like at that point of time. And they were doing trade with this side of the world, right? To, for, to Vietnam, Indonesia. and yeah, yeah, this, uh, These soldiers and all came only after 10th century. Okay. 10th, 11th century. Then okay. Cholas became very powerful. It was by about the end of 7th century AD, slowly deltas were being opened up for paddy cultivation. Okay. And Kaveri Delta happened to be the yes. source of wealth for the Cholas. Yes. And among, among the contemporary kings, Cholas certainly uh, became the most powerful. Yes, yes. And, so they, and, they were yeah, and why did they want to bring Ganga to the South? I, I, I did uh, like what is the story? Ganga Chalapura. Yeah, the Ganga Konda Cholapura. It's a, a huge delta, wetland. Okay. That so could be cultivated. That is a lot of paddy. Okay. And then in addition to that, they were uh, 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 they were attacking other neighboring kingdoms and then looting and plundering them because they uh, both Rajendra and Raja Raja Chawla, his father, mm -hmm. uh, had plundered Sri Lanka. Yes. Various kingdoms. And you can see their power stated in architecture. Raja Raja Chawla, perhaps the most powerful, uh, he he built up uh, the Tanjavur. Uh, yes, 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 the Surya Temple. And that was incomplete because yes. he was able to uh, get it done. Up to that, only at the age of 70. But his son, instead of completing that project, he started new. opened another project, you know, Pradeshura Temple, yeah. uh, Gangai Kondachalapuram. 
Yes. So the it means that these temples were political statements in architecture. Show their yes. power. Yes. Show their power. Yes. yes. Rajendra Chola uh, thought of even bringing Ganges directly to Ganges Kondo Cholapuram. And then uh, you know, that was the assumption. He built a huge temple and then the biggest of the Shivalinga and uh, water getting poured on it. Okay, so so not did, Ganges, did, he, did he manage to bring Ganga, sir? What is the story behind no, no, no. He, that? That was went, only a story. Yeah, he went fighting yeah. against everybody to bring Ganga to the... Yes, these are all stories. And okay. then uh, um, see some people even made a myth that he was able to bring Ganga, pleased Ganges, and then Ganges was ready to come over and okay. pour okay. over to the Shivalinga okay. and so on. But okay. these are all ambitious uh, stories. But okay, why did the name come, sir? Why did the why did the name Ganga Konda Cholapuram come to that place? Yeah, the, the naming itself is an assertion that is Ganga Konda that he was able to bring Ganges to. Okay, <laughs> that is a statement. Yes. Okay, so it's just a statement. Nothing actually happened. Yeah. And then and that shows the level of monarchy uh, he was able to accomplish. Okay. Both Raja Raja and Rajendra were uh, absolute monarchs, mm. literally speaking. And that uh, uh, stated in architecture. So you have to read these temples as political statements of absolute monarchy. Okay, okay. What I wanted to ask you is that, sir, um, the huge difference in Indian lifestyle in the period of the kingdoms, and I want to know the difference yeah. of the Indian lifestyle in the period of the invasions. So what was the lifestyle difference, dif- I mean, difference, yes. like clear difference which you could point out? that People on the West Coast experienced and also started knowing that relationship with the traders also would involve colonization, attack and taking political power and so on. Oh. That began for the first time with the Portuguese people. Oh. They, they wanted to have their own factory, their colony, their direct control over resources, and then uh, control over people like this. So colonization... And, and followed by British. <laughs> and followed by British. Yes, followed by the Dutch and then... <laughs> The French and then the British. Okay, yes. okay. So, how did the states form yeah. later on, sir? Is there any? So, so, the state formations right now. What are the states right now? Is there any particular yeah. reason for is it like speaking so many dialects, so many languages? How did they decide yeah. to you know form like that? Is it depending on the kingdom? State, state formation. Yeah, like Kerala, Karnataka, Andhra. Now Andhra has become into Telangana, but. Yeah, certainly, there were uh, linguistic groups were there. People always spoke different languages in the border yeah. area. Yes. But when the the language based states came into being after independence, so we'll just we'll jump to the education part. The, um, how it when it started? Is it like from the megalithic age? Did it even start, or it started from prehistoric period? You said that it's already started from prehistoric period. The Brahmi script and everything. And no, prehistoric, there was no Brahmi. Oh, there was no Brahmi? Brahmi was, no, no, no. Prehistoric period, there was no writing. They might have used some magical signs and so on, but no script. With pictures. And we do not know whether they were. With pictures, maybe they used to have a language because in caves and all in ancient. No, we do not know any idea about uh, the communication of the prehistoric period, but okay. definitely they might have used some sounds. Some mm-hmm. howling and so on, um, mainly for communicating danger with the people, uh, which you find even some of the monkeys use, birds use yes. sounds, but proper language developed on 70,000 years ago, 70, 75,000 years ago, uh, a proper language developed and then writing system. Writing system cannot, writing was a one time invention when language was uh, a biologically given property and many people uh, developed language. So you have various languages all over the world, but still different families of languages. 
but writing was a one time invention in the semitic area uh, and then it spread to various places okay before the portuguese or british came to india what was the kind of education we were having <coughs> what kind of education were we having e- education only learning by doing along with the parents looking at what parents were doing what the fellow members were doing and then learning there was no institution called the educational institution for training people that was a very late phenomenon okay you will have in india the earliest uh, form in the in the gurukulas the parnasalas yeah of, yeah. Of yeah in ramayana we we hear that you know rama was yes. sent to the gurukula yeah. yeah so sages sages living in the forest and then uh, learners going there okay. perhaps the first formal institution for education was established by the buddhist and jain takshashila yes yes and nalanda with nalanda and, yeah there were uh, such uh, institutions they were formal institutions for diffusion of lang- diffusion of uh, knowledge diffusion of knowledge <laughs> yeah so you, you can uh, call them as the counterpart of universities okay <laughs> okay <laughs> but uh, in a, other small small places gurukulas were there and uh, and in south india we have learning institution attached to the temple kandalur uh, kandalur shala morikulam shala and so yes, on yes 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 where vedic schools attached to the temples okay and later period we have gurukulas um kodalur uh, gurukulam kodungallur gurukulam the the latest okay. and uh, of all the most important was kudalur from where we have um, identified uh, recovered uh, various texts a text in malayalam um, the whole harpa shastra uh, was collected from kudalur mana kudalur was the area where a uh, calculus developed the first uh, textbook in the world was found in a place called alathiyur near kudalur uh that was written by jeshta deva is called yukti bhasha the first textbook in calculus uh, based on what is called infinite series infinite series or power series generally called by modern mathematicians as a sine cosine series <laughs> the advanced trigonometry yeah <laughs> developed at that time actually it was developed in europe first by leibniz and then by gregory newton and others but with calculus they were able to understand planetary movements and also they were able to develop physics here planetary movements could be understood but you don't find any sign of developing physics <laughs> because <laughs> our concern was to predict grahana yes eclipse how to predict eclipse was important because uh, for the conduct of a yaga sometimes they might have taken one year one and a half years if an eclipse befalls chandra grahana or surya grahana befalls the entire yaga would be spoiled because uh, eclipse was considered to be a pollutant yes <laughs> so it was big religious important i mean a, a big need of religious importance for the people of kerala that are not all people but the nampudri brahmins of kerala yeah. they wanted to, to predict uh, the solar eclipse and lunar eclipse for this ritual reasons okay. but they certainly that ritual compulsion had led them to the discovery of calculus and it was first discovered by mathava sangama grama sangama grama is kodalur actually although sometimes people interpret it as iringa iringala kuda mathava the mathava might have studied and taught at the kodalur gulam and he developed a calculus there and he had several disciples and then uh, calculus was further developed by people like um, um, Pudumana Swamiyaji and uh, um, other Swamiyajis and uh, various mathematicians known for it. Now, instead of saying Leibniz series, Cyclopedia Britannica refers to Madhava Leibniz series. Wow, okay. Yeah, it is, it is recognized at the global level. So, and later on the Britishers came and then we learned English and then they are learned. Uh, uh, yes, that was a different story <laughs> then. And we got formal... colleges in students yes. <laughs> and formal universities for which we don't have a long history so do you think education is helpful to shape the human being because nowadays education is becoming like a professional training 
all the degrees yeah. we are getting all you know we keep on doing all the masters and everything it's only for the job you're doing but is, shouldn't it be helping to shape the human beings yes yes education certainly accounted for the growth of human civilization that yeah. is production of knowledge in fact i have written a book on history and theory of production of knowledge published by oxford university press so there i trace the whole history of knowledge how history uh, i mean how knowledge history is demonstrating translation of knowledge into higher and higher material culture without uh, knowledge even social development would not have been possible yes all social reforms and social movements happened because of the releasing of explosive knowledge critical knowledge so, so various people uh, like uh, ayya vaikundha swami and sri narayan guru said you educate and agitate the education will help you understand things critically and then you realize it and that will help you organize people with the same kind of critical mind and realization and then there is a joint movement collective movement uh, leading society to a different plane an agitated group alone will be able to create a new kind of society improvement always has the motor of agitation a contented group of people will not be able to change they will always maintain stability stability is not the character of science science questions but science always expresses itself in the form of technology and it transforms okay okay yeah. so are we losing our skill education in this mainstream education we need the skills also these days because we are now living in knowledge society where use of knowledge is very important and participation in knowledge economy will help you only if you are able to produce knowledge that even produce marketable knowledge so there is compulsion on today's education to be skill oriented to be technology oriented and you have that amazing kind of technology called digital technologies and with the help of that you are able to do wonders artificial intelligence augmented reality mixed reality uh and robotics of all kinds yes, and yes, yes. and you know it's an altogether different world uh when you talk about technology it means most of the jobs particularly paid jobs a paid job is anybody's dream a youngster would be interested in securing the youngster is always looking for uh, subjects which would pay him better in future or subjects would fetch him a good well paid job okay therefore there is certainly importance but for the making of a good citizenry you need human values yes and various things that you draw from history and uh, liberal arts and social sciences by way of lessons yes they are important for the making of an ethically dignified human being mere technologist will go with a robot yeah <laughs> without values <laughs> yes yeah 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 so so the last question i'm going to let you go after this like do you think the education today is very costly right do you think it does it have to be that costly education it is highly priced because it is yes. right priced is the right word sorry sir highly yes <laughs> yeah. yes uh and uh, you no know, education used to be a public good earlier now it is a trade object it's a, a, a trillion air business education is a big industry today so now you are seeing globally competitions uh, amongst the universities healthy is that healthy so sir it's not healthy it will marginalize the poor further and there is actually the possibility of ill mobility yes. from the economically back, uh, say backward position to a well off position it, it's a, it's a pyramid technology continuously happening in the society the pyramid it, it, the yes. one person now Yeah. education is going to be completely elitist yes only people uh who can pay will be able to acquire highly paid skills yes highly paid technological potency or there is um, going to be a period of already happened a huge cleavage between 
rich and poor mm-hmm. you find uh, billionaires are getting multiplied yes. which means more and more uh, people are pushed into the margin and also in the process of this kind of development many people are losing their livelihoods they are relocated from their places and many people are just pushed into annihilation and all these uh, all these are consequences of today's kind of development but you know we certainly have organizations and forums and so on cause of life and poor but the developmental economy is um, having its unchecked march yes yes hope that changes soon sir and i will let yeah. you i will not take more of your time um rajan yeah. sir i really wish you would come on my show again and to speak about some other topics because you are like a ocean of knowledge thank you so much for coming on the show sir thank you so much oh. okay thank you for giving thank me so a chance much. like this and thank okay. you very much it's my okay. pleasure and there is going to be exciting podcast coming up so please do subscribe so that you can get all the videos we're going to do a very good um uh podcast on education particularly going abroad and studying abroad and all the tips to do over there so yeah please do subscribe thank you